So good morning, everybody. Uh, so I said my name is Inge Jonkere. Um, for the people who know me, it's, it may be important to tell that I switched jobs. So as very nicely introduced, I'm now at ESA. For the ones knowing from my former life, I was 15 years in FAO, uh, working on platforms and remote sensing and capacity building uh, in the forestry department. So I switched as you said, now in the green solution. So basically, uh, for people who don't know ESA, I have a few slides on ESA, but I said my talk will be on the platforms, open science, open data, and linked to climate. So for the, I think everybody in the room knows ESA. I hope so. If not, I uh, have a few slides uh, to go through this. So what's the European Space Agency? Uh, for Europeans, it's very important, and people always want to know about budgets. So basically, each of you pays 12 euro every year to ESA, uh, and then we hope to do something good with that. Um, so there's two, 22 member states, so all the member states are part of ESA, and these are the ones also steering the programs. So it is not the Commission, it's a European agency, um, with the idea, and as said here, so the cooperation among the member states on space research, technology and applications. Very important, especially in these times, it's exclusively peaceful, so we don't do defense. Uh, as we also know, the budgets of defense and uh, space is very much together, so in these challenging times we're going to see how that will work out. Um, in 2025 there's a ministerial and then we will see how we can uh, move forward for the next five years. So the member states, so there's not all the European countries, so unfortunately, so only the member states who make part have also that geo return, so making sure that the science and also the space science in the countries can move ahead. So here you see the list. We have associate members, of course it's not closed, it's always open to new members, and so we have a few new members as Slovenia and Slovakia this year. So always open for collaboration. So I said I'm in Ezrin. Uh, Ezrin is in Frascati, so close to Rome. There are five sites uh, of ESA, but important, and I think also specifically for this conference, the Earth Observation is in Ezrin. So this is also why I'm based in Ezrin. But as for people who know ESA, there's also a big hub on climate, climate modeling, which is in Harwell, close to Oxford. Uh, we have the big site where they really built the satellites in Aztec in Holland. Um, but the Earth Observation, the use of the data, data processing uh, is in Ezrin. So this is an aerial photographer where it is. So we're about a thousand people working there and then it's a very big hub for, for visitors. So for people who haven't been there, please come along. And as you can see a bit, it's in the middle of the vineyards. A bit that's here actually. So it's a very nice place to visit. Um, so I said before, it's Earth Observation which is there. We have also a part on space transportation. We have the Vega European Launcher. There's a small team which is hosted there. And so there's a lot of other uh, units which maybe are not so relevant for this talk today. But for example, the near object. So really trying to find a way that there's no, not no collisions between meteorites and the Earth. So that's also taking place there. And then the security office, corporate IT, as you can imagine, as, as, as you saw in the first, this first slide, there's over 2,000 people working in ESA. So of course, there's a lot of admin also going on. So a lot of this is also there. So then the security office, so I said 50,000 visitors per year, so people are very proud on that. So you just have now the, the figures. So, but today we're here to talk about open science, digital innovation. So I said, indeed, ESA, you could say, is a facilitator also to increase the competitiveness of space science in the European countries. But as, as already introduced, we also do science and we also have a whole part on the applications. So basically, the division that was just mentioned, so the green solutions, used to be called the data application division, and it encompasses science, applications, digital innovation, and also the competitiveness. So we do see that these open science and these digital innovation are the new discoveries in order to have and to rev revolutionize, hopefully, the society and economic impact of research. So one of the things ESA really wants to look into is really to make a change in society and make sure that all the applications which are done really have an impact on science. So this is also why the program which I stand for, my division, is called EO4 Society. So then to talk about all the uh, missions, all the Earth observation missions, I started uh, working in Earth observation in 1908. So at that time, there were very few satellites. For people working with remote sensing, you know now, 
I just wanted to show with this slide how many there are, so we can't almost not going into it. Um, and we do group them in ESA among the science um, satellites. So you can see the, a lot of the Earth explorers take part of that. We have Copernicus. Um, I think everybody knows Copernicus, knows the Sentinels. So that, that's very nice collaboration between ESA and the European Commission. So nice collaboration, meaning that it's a joining of funds. And so, as you know, the Commission pays for it, and then ESA is the one deploying it. And then the meteorologic, which probably a lot of you work in as well, uh, together with UMITSAT. So I won't go through all of these, but as you know, and I think most of you use many of them also for your research. It's not finished yet. We're also looking to next generation. There's new Sentinels uh, being launched for the people who follow it a bit up. Sentinel 2C was just launched to replace then um, the one we're getting out of order. So we com constantly looking into new ones and also new needs in order to encompass all the science needs. So then the use of that data, because that's very important. Uh, here you can see a graph. So the Copernicus has that downstream center of the services. And with the advance also of the cloud-based processing, which I'm sure all of you are really working with, imagine that before there was not on a cloud, it was really downloading the data one by one. Of course, things are very different now. So if you can see uh, through the time, so the first graph is from 2015, it's huge, the difference. And also the advance of the cloud-based processing, you can see um, it's per different sensors. So the Sentinel-1 and 2, the 1 is in yellow and the 2 is in green. So you can see what a difference it makes also with these open access hubs. So that's something which for a space agency and also for universities, it's a big difference. I worked along in um, um, development aids, so also there having a cloud-based computing part is a very different story than going there with the hard disk, which seems to be a long time ago, but it's actually not that long ago. So then the whole thing ahead, so what do we do? We have all these algorithms, we have all this data, the data has become so much, so where do we go and ex exactly what we do with it? So the idea is really to move the algorithm user to the data. So but maybe that's not that simple. So for the ESA part, I've been working with them for 25 years. I just joined a few months ago. So for me, I always thought that we need to be much closer to the end users, to the needs. So this is in that sense, we'd have a new paradigm ahead, but it's maybe not that simple. But I will show with a few examples the tentatives from ESA also to move in that direction. So the open science for ESA is important because there's something called as Earth action. So as you know, there's so much data, but data is only useful when it really becomes information, not when it's just simple raw data. And so it's very challenging to implement, and the solutions, there's a lot of barriers. So I think everybody of you knows these barriers working with the data. What about standards? What about sharing? What about reproducibility? Imagine any paper, if you want to do the reproduction of the data, you need to be able to do so. The access to infrastructure. So basically, all these, it's very general, but I think all of you working with data have gone through this one. So this is why we were, we were really facing all these challenges, and the idea is that these innovative data sets could really enrich the knowledge of our planet. Because if all the data is out there from all these satellites I've just shown, if you cannot use it in actionable information, it's a big loss, and it's also a big loss of, of money. So the big question is, is, can the community really reuse these products and also these methods we develop? Because I think a lot of you here have had ESA projects, but then when a project ends, what happens? It just goes into the void. Nothing happens with it. What about the products? Has it been also go to the next mile, taking up maybe for commercialization? So this is really a new idea, a new way forward. We really have to look into that. It's not a project-based something, because as you all know, climate crisis is going on. It's not a static thing. It's a long-term uh, planning and also long-term foreseeing we have to do. So this is why the graph is how we see it from Earth observation, open science, and innovation in ESA. So open data, I think that's one of the key things with the opening of the Landsat archive in 2011. I think you can see the pickup also in the scientific uh, literature. It changed dramatically because before, and I do remember for my thesis, I think we bought a uh, satellite image for a few thousand euro. So that was the standard and reality. So if you can see now, all that free data, even commercial data, often very often freely available. I think that's crucial. It changed the whole way we work. Open source code, that's something also um, 
think a lot of people also here in the room really strive for this. It's a very big difference if you can use the code, reuse the code, share code. The GitHub who started as a platform in which everybody could see the code. Before that was not the case. So you needed to write the individual scientists to get some code. So the whole thing, it's very different. Then also the linked and executable code, open access end-to-end -end to workflows linked then to platforms which show that you can reproduce the data which you had before. Education, uh, always very important when there's new tools coming out that people keep on um, updated. The open science practice, so I think this is an amazing forum in which people really um, talk about how they do open science. And then a community behind, the fora, all the, the, the networks which really are set up to do all this. So that it's not one isolated scientist in an ivory tower do the work. So then how do we want to do this? Um, by ESA, we have earth codes. Uh, I don't know if people heard from earth codes. So it's a fair and open earth uh, system. It really tried to implement the vision I just uh, show you about open science for earth science activities. So I indeed, I have to uh, strengthen that in ESA, we do have the Science Hub, we do have an Earth Science uh, Activity Center, and I will explain in a minute how this works. So what is it really? So ESA, uh, as you know, it's a facilitator of science, but there's that Science Hub who really wants to do science, and it's really to get a strategic initiative to have a fair open science practice. So it's an infrastructure, so using these existing platforms, fair and open tooling, as we call it, so to really store that data, and then to link it to community. So basically the full uh, flow. So who is the implementer? So it's Tiri Spazio. So it's a long-term contract, and the first platforms are selected this year. So for people who really want more detail, please come and see me afterwards. But the idea is that it's the code really will always expand the capabilities, so the cloud service and also the tools really tailored for the Earth observation data. So how does it work? Well, of course, there's a lot of computational resources. There's a catalog to the resources to read, to manage, and also to get the whole community behind it. So here you can see the different parts. So we have the data, of course, the methods, the workflows, these management tools, very important for us, also the capacity building with that. So the FAIR management tools. And so let's say, as I said before, we really want to have this as a long-term storage in project results. So instead of having all these small projects who then go into the void, we really want to see this as a long-term ESA infrastructure. So the idea is also the management, of course, by the project remains with the PIs, but so the projects can have access uh, to that earth code. So a community, as I said before, very important, also after the project has been finished in order to have that discussion going and maybe an uptake to go to a next stage. So where we are in this whole development process, so I said it's something quite new. So these are uh, very recent slides coming from the team in my division who's working on this. So the portals in development, so there you can have um, the the website link. So the idea is that the first platforms have been selected. It will start to really develop the capability to package and publish, and the selected provider for the community will start. So there will be a whole set of tutorials, guides, and whatever you need. So here is also the project link. I think these slides will be shared, so um, you will have the access code. So why to adopt? I think. We as scientists here in this room, I think everybody agrees on the fact that we need to have findable, accessible, interoperable, and also re reusable platforms. I don't think anybody does know these FAIR principles, so that's very crucial. The idea we have here is also to have these um, crucial open compliant parts for ESA programs, but also the Horizon programs. So I think many of you are in both, so it's important to also have that link between these two. And then what's the advantage for this funding compliance here is that, for example, many funding bodies really require open science and data management to be really part of these research proposals. Um, if you go back 20 years ago, that was really not the case. Now, very often, it's a requirement. So in that sense, it really simplifies, let's say, that open science policy we have with ESA and the European Commission. So then publishing these research outputs, also there, uh, it's very nice to have these scientific papers, but it's very niche. Um, not everybody reads all these peer-reviewed journals. Not everybody looks at all the journals. So in that sense, we do have an open science catalog. 
So really where it allows you not only to publish the data sets, but also the code and then also research outputs for the global audience. So the idea is really to have a long-term uh, strategy, long-term accessibility, and also to increase visibility of your work. So yeah, you could see this as maybe as a um, promoting talk, but what is really the advantage? So your research outputs are indexed, very much more citable, which of course I know people work at university, it's a very big marker of how good your work is. It's compliant with open science journals, for example from AGU, it's secure, sustainable storage, and you don't need to worry about these long-term data preservation, because that's something which I think in a lot of academic parts or even centers that might be an issue. So we hope that this will bring um, some relief in that part. So then, um, so it integrates the ESA Open Science Data Catalog, as said, so, but nothing without support and learning. Um, as I said before, capacity building sometimes it's called. So it's really to help um, also master EO data say science. The data science also in the cloud, the data management and the storage. And so why do we need also this uh, capacity building and this support and learning? Also because it's not a static tool. It will always evolve and in order to show also the changes in there. So there are resources also foreseen for both beginners and also experienced researchers. So let's just take a practical example. If you have a new activity, it can be onboarded to the Earth Code, sponsored via, via the network of researchers, which I will come back to in a minute, which is a platform, so you get a new product and a new method. It's linked to a visualization-ready platform where you can have third parties, application, and dashboard, and through open EO, reproducible, and cataloged. So you do get a DOI, and it's personally stored. So in that sense, it's a long-term um, perspective. So as said before, in ESA we do have different uh, science hubs. We have grouped them via clusters and here you can see all the clusters we have for now. Um, for people who have never been in Ezrin, it's actually a quite nice science hub tool you could see. It's a bit like these uh, Googles of the world where you can have these hubs and the beehives where you can uh, have an exchange between uh, researchers coming in as a visiting expert for a few months. So people who are um, maybe interested in doing so, please come and see me afterwards. We have a very nice scheme. It's not only linked to uh, European researchers, we have it in all these teams, but it's really meant to have a cross-collaboration between all the ongoing activities. So ESA really wants to be close to really what's happening in academia. So, I said before how we do it in there. So I said before it calls EO for society. What do we do then there? Because it's quite abstract. But so the idea is really to educate, support, empower, collaborate, and practice. Practice, as I said before, of course, there's a lot of ESA projects, but there's a lot of other projects which also needs that storage or that long-term vision. So the idea is really to merge these two in this earth code. Um, here's one of the examples. And I said before, so what happens with all these, um, there's so many projects, and as you all know, I think everybody of you is involved in many projects. What happens afterwards? What do we do with the data? Do we really use it at the full capacity? So the idea is really to increase the use of this research data, that it's not only used for maybe one scientific high level or other paper, but really to embed it in everything that we can be doing for applications, also for society. So that's why we see that research data is the data and the metadata and the code, but also documented so it can be used. So this is an example from in the science hub, from the cryosphere, in which the melting of the polar ice sheet uh, is used. And so we really want to use the increase of that research data. So we'll go through you with this example, uh, very specific from um, the ice sheet. So as said before, it's to support earth action. Um, Earth Action is a big pillar of the ESA program for Earth Observation, so in which we really want to make data to actionable data. And Earth Action is everything around the climate and also the society. So going to flood mapping uh, apps of helping uh, farmers in really to increase their yield. So this is an example of the Arctic. So making more and better use of these data, uh, so I said before, also for maybe new end users, which are maybe non-spatial uh, users. So science bringing innovation. Uh, as you know, also for the European Commission, competitiveness is, is very important because they also want to thrive the industry on space in Europe 
And so the idea is to better use that data will also help maybe to get uh, commercialization of some tools which can be very useful. So um, how does it all work? So it's really from the data to society, information, the actions, but also the citizens. So not only stopping at the level of the scientists, but going beyond and bring it to society. So this is a cloud computing platform with levels of abstraction. We do have research data. As said, we catalog it, so it stays there. It's not a one-time goal. It's a long-term thing. It links to the code and the documentation. The visualization, very important for policymakers, because if you come up with a paper, maybe no one's going to read it, but if you have a nice visualization, it really can make a difference for policymakers. With these properties, also the storytelling. So I'll show you the different slides. So the distributed data sources, um, of course, there's so much going on, and I have to say I'm, I'm sure you are much more expert than I am on all these different platforms. So this is the open EO we have. Um, the data is organized in collections. It's a kind of data cube, as we call it uh, lately, so which are these multi-dimensional arrays. And you can see so that all the documentation is there too. So we use these distributed sources of data. Then it's possible in different ways to access it. So, so there you can have a view. So we really use these raster data sets to do the data mining to have all these geophysical variables. So then here, uh, as you know, and as I said before, there's so much data. I think now one of the, the difficulties of these times is really to check which is the best usable data we have. So we do have that Sentinel hub, as we talked about before. So remember these Copernicus satellites. We do have the batch processing. And then here, um, this is an example of the cloud-optimized geotiff. And then the next step, of course, is to go with that cloud computing platform to that research data. So with then the different levels of abstraction to really facilitate exploitation, because I think all of you really do have these issues now. How do we process all this? We have all these open, uh, all these APIs. Where do we go to really abstract all the data? So here, for example, this is that Earth System Data Lab we have. So we use the Xcube data stores. So the whole interaction with all the different users, with using, for example, our interfaces. We have the Python, we do have the web interfaces, so it's all interlinked. And then we do have the Sentinel Hub API in which it's linked up to. So the third part is these workflows and also reprodu reproducibility, uh, very keen also for everything that has to do with, for example, the MRV. If we take all these data processing in, for example, the climate world with the climate finance, you know that there's standards which has to be fulfilled in order to get access to this climate finance. So in that sense, um, we need this repro reproducibility. So this is an example uh, of these deep ETSL um, collaborative tools. So we use, in that sense, the Jupyter Notebooks, which I think you're all very familiar with. And then the idea is to put this data really also on a catalog. So here, the reproducibility is seen here with these different processes using all these different stacks. And then here you have the editor platform of OpenEO. So the, the, it really allows dynamically translating these process graphs from a visual workflow to the client library. So in this sense here, it's Python, the JavaScript, R. So it's really an export of all this code. So then with the catalog and also the, the documentation linked to it, you can see we put it in an open science catalog. So here, linked to the different clusters. So as I showed before, we have the atmosphere, cryosphere, and land cluster. So here on this catalog, it's linked individually. So the success stories of Sentinel. So in order to really uh, show what's going on and really make it also for a bigger audience, we do have these success stories. So not only the scientific papers, and through the catalogs, that's also something you can uh, find in there on the Copernicus. So what about on this data visualization? It's not only to show cool uh, images, but also, as said, to link it to the policymakers. And then it can also link back also for funding. So in that sense, it is very important. It's very important for society, for people who are not um, coders, who are not familiar with the remote sensing. 
And so in this sense, here you could see, for example, the multivariate data exploration and analytics. So we're still working on that um, proposal, as I showed, from the Arctic. So here you can see, for example, very nice graphs showing um, how you can use what's the metadata. So that's, we call this an advanced visualization. And so this is also with the deep ESDL Jupyter Hub. So here you can see this is from a project called EarthWave from ESA. And then I remember we were talking about these ice sheets. So here also some very nice visualization who for non-expert uh, users immediately gives a very nice overview of what you can do. So here is these data cubes. So here you can have a visual view of these different stacks. And you can see it can also be on a mobile. It can uh, give the location. So this is a project uh, with the University of Leipzig. And then we come to the final part. So after you have all these different parts, you also can have a very nice story. And these stories seem to be redundant, but in fact, they're extremely important also for ESA for showing, as I brought you back, everybody's paying 12 euro a, a year for the ESA work to really show what's going on with all this. So we do have a platform together with NASA and JAXA in which we have a dashboard where all these stories come together. Also showing that Europe is not on its own. We really work together with the other agencies and it integrates these data sets with the different tools um, as you can see here. So also these um, websites are freely available. You can also find all the data and information on there. So then in this storytelling also, it's very important to communicate and the scientific science with these interactive web-based solutions. So having just one nice graph is not enough anymore. So now we really have these um, interactive stories. So this is an example um, of that dashboard, which goes on the forest loss and the degradation. So how do we provide this free at the point of use? So of course, it's based on commercial services as well, sponsored for research, meaning that you as a researcher can use it for free because it has been sponsored. And so therefore, we also have that network of resources in which you can have that long-term um, storage, I would say, from your projects. So you can see here, there's almost 90 countries who have now um, project sponsored through this. So you can browse this portfolio and select a service. You use the pricing wizard to calculate the cost. You can fill in the ESA sponsorship form, and then you get this um, network of researchers as a tool to use for your research. So this is uh, the actual map where all these projects are taking place. So I don't know if there's people here who work with the network of resources. Well, you do, so that's great. So, you, so it means that you, you know the use of it. And we're also open to see if there's things we should do better. So please come and see me also if you have questions on that. Because this is for ESA and especially for the Green Solution Division, a very useful tool because it really uh, enhances the collaboration with the academia. So I think this is in a nutshell again what I've been talking about. So we do have the science application and then I said the industry. Um, we do have these different cloud-based collaboration parts and the idea is really to have these with these fair principles. So here again, the different parts of it. I think I will have to speed up a bit. And then we also come to the last part, which I think also some of you are involved. We do have these GTIFs, so the green transition information factories, because remember, we have to go to a new transition. So the information factories is a tool also to have all the, the technology together with this. So this is an example of the space showcase, the actionable information in this green transition, and then all the uh, capabilities, of course, and a lot of domains, because I know there's a GTIF also for Austria. Maybe some of you are involved. And so this is my last slide. So this is an example of a very nice wind turbine detection on demand for Germany in this uh, GTIF service deployed on an open EO platform. Through that sponsored through that network of resources. And so the idea is to support the future uh, efforts in European assessment. So showing you from all the way from the research to really a very concrete tool for uh, citizens in uh, uh, Germany. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope uh, you got something from ESA now. Please come and see me if you have questions on the NOR, on all of these tools. As I said, I'm, I just joined, so I'm... Uh, 
only four months in place, but I'm really looking forward also to make this a really uh, useful tool, also to work on the collaborations, to see where the science hub, that it really goes to society. So uh, I invite you for the <laughs> collaborations for the future. Thank you.